is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Today's episode is sponsored by Inside Tracker and supported by Orgain and Practice Better. Stay tuned to hear more about these amazing companies that I'm partnered with. But for now, let's get to the conversation. I quickly just wanted you to know that the first six minutes of recording this podcast episode, we had a few hiccups with our internet connectivity. So the audio is not of the greatest quality. There is a few hiccups, but please bear with it. This is just for the first few up to six minutes of the episode, and then it gets better from there. So I hope you stick with it and enjoy listening. Hello, fans and listeners. Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez here again. And today we have Emily Tehan as a guest. I'm super excited to talk with her. Emily is a graduate student on the volleyball team at Stanford University, where she is currently pursuing a master's degree in community health and prevention research. She recently graduated from Columbia University, where she majored in biology and followed the pre-med path while playing for the volleyball team. During her time at Columbia, she was named to the All-Ivy League team and academic All-Ivy League team. In addition, she represented Canada on the junior national team in 2018. I learned of Emily not only as an outstanding athlete and bright student, but as a mentor for other athletes through Voice and Sport, where she leads honest discussions around body image. And I hope to you know, have some of that discussion with her today as well. So Emily, thank you so much for being willing to chat with me and the people listening today. (laughs) Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. You know, this is actually the first, you are our first student athlete guest who's like a non-client. Like I've had clients of mine come on the podcast who might be student athletes, but yeah, I, I just thought that was kind of a, a cool thing to note. Um, that is awesome. Yeah. And, and I think too, also there's been a shift. I actually don't, I should have prepared for this. I don't know all the policies behind it. Maybe you can shed some light, but like there's been a shift in just the way college athletes can kind of like brand themselves and get their word out there and stuff compared to how it used to be. Mm-hmm. So I think this is one of those things where it's like, oh, like you are really like as a student athlete, you're doing more than just studying and playing in your sport, but you're really being like an advocate for other female athletes and a mentor to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a really cool opportunity with with the new policies of NIL for student athletes. Unfortunately, I can't profit off of any of my connections because I'm an international student. I'm from Canada. But for some of my teammates, it's been a really awesome opportunity for them to connect with new people and just form business connections beyond what the sport used to allow us to do. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that when you being from Canada, you don't profit, but it's still those connections and networking and you, you know, one, serving other people, which there's a great Mm -hmm. reward in that. And then two, like, you know, when you do graduate, as you eventually will, like you've, you know, already kind of like built this network and connections. So it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting shift and how it's all kind of playing out over the last couple of years. Connections, like a bunch of people. Um, literally all around the world. Some of the, some of the athletes attended my sessions with Wilson Sport have been from Mexico or from various parts of the U.S. And it's been really cool to connect with these people and learn their experience and compare it to some of my own. And as much as I think sometimes the ideas that I mentor to them, they also they also provide me with advice. And, and I think that's really cool to have shared space that you can have these tough conversations and, and really benefit on the ends. Yeah. Absolutely. It's so cool. So I think another kind of question I had for you as being a current student athlete, you are currently getting your master's degree. And so you did four years of getting your degree. 
and being a volleyball player at Columbia. And now you getting your master's and we talked offline about this. It's because of what happened with COVID where the NCAA gave you that extra year of eligibility. So as you're pursuing your math master's, you're able to use the extra year of eligibility to compete with the Stanford team. But what's that transition like for you? Just because it's like, okay, you're not a freshman. You're not a newbie. You're very experienced. You're one of the older ones on the team. And yet it's a brand new team for you to, you know, mesh with. What's that transition been like so far this year? It's been really great. I had no idea really what to expect coming in because like you said, I was coming in as new, a new person to the team, but wasn't a freshman, but I had I had really like, gone through the whole college experience and girls that I was coming in with were just finishing high school. So that was a really kind of interesting economy to be part of, but it has been really amazing so far. Everyone on the team was incredibly welcoming. The coaching staff is really awesome, making sure that I kind of found my place on the team. And uh, I've made some really, really great friends on the team that have made the transition really pretty easy. Um, so very fortunate to be surrounded by just a ton of great people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. It's a unique situation, whether it be the extra year of eligibility for COVID or people who maybe did like a medical red shirt and maybe then are like, or just red shirting and then join a different team. It's, I'm sure poses its challenges, but you know, you, you are experienced, you're not a freshman, but you still have to get used to how the team operates and everything. Cause it's, it's new people, new coaches, and all that to get used to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that is something that I really wanted to come in with. Was even though I didn't have experience at Columbia, I knew that coming to a new team in a new environment really meant that everything was going to be different, likely, and or similar in in some ways, but different in other ways. And and so really came just with an open mindset as to um, kind of what my role would be in the team and the systems that we would run and. The um, just interactions with each other between coaches and players. Um, so I was really excited to be part of an environment and, and learn as much as I can from my short time here. For sure. Okay, so Emily, I can't even imagine personally the just challenges that you maybe have experienced or not. We'll see with just going to one Columbia is an Ivy League school, uh, very challenging to get into and I'm sure keep up with once you are in there. And then Stanford for a master's degree, get another really prestigious school. So here you are balancing the pressures of a competitive athletic environment of competing as a, as an athlete with also a very competitive academic environment. I mean, I don't want to make assumptions. Do you feel that pressure or is that just very normal for you? Just kind of something that you've always like, that's just kind of how you operate or have there been some challenges being in these kind of, yeah, just competitive, more high stake environments over the last four going on five years? Yeah. So I have always been really passionate about both athletics and academics. I do want to go into medicine in the future. And so that does entail a lot of schooling, but I really believe that if if it's what I love and what I think I'll be happy doing, then it's worth putting in the time and the effort for sure. So I think that just kind of throughout my entire life, I've always been passionate about pursuing both at the highest level. And I think that, of course, that still comes with challenges. There have been a lot of challenges along the way, transitioning as a freshman at Columbia, trans- like transitioning into college and being in a new environment with different lecture styles and, and different exam formats. That was an adjustment period for sure. But I was really fortunate to have upperclassmen on my team at the time who were in the same major as me and kind of provided me with a lot of guidance as to some of their favorite classes or strategies that worked well for them and doing work together on the road. So that was a really great resource to have as a freshman that helped me to adjust to the academic environment at Columbia as well as the athletic environment. And then coming to Stanford here, there was another adjustment period uh, with switching from the semester system to the quarterly system. So now that I have gotten used to that a little bit and having different style of classes again, a lot of my classes are very small and discussion based here at Stanford, just with the nature of my program. So I'm no longer in like large lectures and taking a ton of exams all the time. So it's definitely a different style of learning that I'm enjoying as well. But there have been challenges for sure along the road with trying to make sure that I manage everything and prioritize having time for social activities as well and prioritizing me time as well. That's not always as easy when you're 
focusing a lot on academics and athletics and making sure there's a balance for you. Yeah. I love how you mentioned like other teammates, you know, helped you out. It's like find resources and surround yourself with people who help you achieve your goals. And and most likely, whether it be your teammates or people in your classes, like they're also facing those challenges. And so knowing that you're not going through it alone, you have resources, you have people to help and like leaning into that. Because I, I mean, college itself is a transition for everybody, pending your degree, the type of college you go to, and then athletics, it's like sometimes it can feel like so much on you and so much pressure, but knowing you have other people who have been there, other people who have done it, other people who can help you or show you the way. And it's just about surrounding yourself with the right people sometimes. So it's great that you guys were like doing work on the road and stuff, you know, it's like your team was really all on the same mission of being athletes. Yes, but student athletes as well. What are some of these things that you were doing? Like for me time, because you said that can be really challenging. What what are some of those things that you learned like, okay, need to make time and space for me time? What what did that look like for you? Or does that look like for you? <laughs> so a big part of that, I think, was making sure that I had a lot of time for myself and my friends. So my friends, I consider like a big part of kind of me time because they are so... They're the people that I feel like I can be myself around all of the time and really just take my mind away from any academic or athletic stress that I might be experiencing. And so I, my freshman year was kind of a big time for me where I really learned the importance of doing this and making sure that I had time for this. And so a lot of it, I was fortunate kind of through out my four years at Columbia and even here that a lot of my best friends all live within like a five minute walk of me. So it was really easy for uh, to go hang out with them after dinners or in between classes or stuff like that. And even if it's just like a quick coffee catch up, I think that's really important to make time for. And then I also do consider myself an introvert. So having time where I'm just by myself doing things that are kind of mindless was really important to me as well. So I always like to t- kind of like end the day either scrolling through my phone, like on TikTok or Instagram or something like that, or or watching a Netflix show. I My dad and I watch a lot of Netflix shows together. So that's kind of a bit of me time for me is just to kind of relax at the end of the day and maybe watch 20, 30 minutes of a show. And, and then we, my dad and I will talk about it after. So, but yeah, just prioritizing that me time and social time is really really important to finding a balance. Yeah, for sure. I actually love that you brought up sometimes how social media or a Netflix show is is you time because, and we might get into talking about this more, but there's there's a lot of ways in which show, social media can be like, maybe not the best thing for our mental health, but there's also that sometimes you do need to veg out. Like if your brain is going, going, going all the time with school and then your body physically and and brain still going, going, going all the time with practice. And then like, you know, you're socializing and you're walking around campus all the time and you like, you just need to chill sometimes. And that's where, you know, something like 30 minutes of looking things up or or following certain people or reading or watching a show that you can just kind of like chill and not have to be on it all the time is really helpful to people. And so there's this balance, right? Like maybe we don't want to watch Netflix for eight hours straight, but like watching a show and talking to dad about it is like something that's just like no expect. It takes the pressure off, right? Or the rest of your life, you might be feeling like expectations and to-do lists. It's like, this is something just for me and just for fun. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of a time to forget about kind of stress in academic or in, or athletic settings and, and really just like not have to think th- through a ton of things and, and kind of that, like mindless scrolling or mindless watching is what I really enjoy in that kind of me time. And and yeah, so I, I totally understand. Yeah, social media can not be a great place all of the time. But I think that if you can follow certain accounts or things that you're interested in, and kind of filter what you're seeing all of the time, it can be something really great just to kind of mindlessly like disconnect almost from from your, your worries. <laughs> yeah, like as a dietitian, I hate following nutrition accounts, but I love following puppies and babies and comedians like that's who I follow puppies babies and comedians and it's like it brings me joy right so yeah for sure so so let's talk about you and and volleyball 
I, you've been, you've you also, I, I learned from you that you're just a great athlete. You were actually in figure skating at a young age, a really amazing figure skater. But when, when did your love for volleyball begin or maybe even just sports in general? <laughs> yeah. So I feel like as a Canadian, it's almost like as soon as you start walking, you strap skates on your feet. Yeah. So I really started figure skating. Well, I started skating when I was like two years old, but really got into competitive figure skating when I was probably eight years old or so. And I was training 25, 30 hours a week from the time I was like eight till until I was 12 years old. So I was really invested in it. And it kind of was my first real exposure to competitive sport. And, and I loved it. I, it was as grueling as it was. And most eight year olds aren't doing that. I loved it. And it became such a part of my identity. Being an athlete became such a part of my identity and was just a really great way for me to find social connections, but also like have a passion for something and and develop goals. And it really shaped me as a person, I think, being involved in such competitive sport at a young age. But I ended up actually getting into volleyball because I essentially became too tall for figure skating. Um, So not that you can't be tall and be a great figure skater. It's just a lot more challenging when you're constantly growing and your center of balance is changing. So when I was about 12 years old, 12 or 13, my mom kind of was like, hey, maybe we want to look at doing another sport that's better suited for tall for tall people. And so it was kind of looking at basketball or volleyball um, at the time. And I actually really wanted to play basketball. I loved basketball in, in fifth grade. And, and I wasn't as much of a fan of volleyball. And but my mom was very insistent on me going to play volleyball. And so she took me to tryouts and, and, and house leagues. And I ended up actually really loving it and loving it more than I did any other sport. I really wanted to pursue it competitively. And so that's when I started to really focus a lot more on um, on, find, and get, on getting onto the best club teams as possible and, and then hoping to make provincial and national teams. So that's kind of my start in volleyball, but it was a little bit untraditional, but, <laughs> but I am here no, now. Yeah. Yeah, you're here and now. And no, it's definitely and I think like speaking of bodies that I want to get into with you, you know, you our bodies can do amazing thing no matter your size, shape, height, width, whatever. But I think it's also one of those like things. It's like, yeah, like if you're tall, like volleyball and basketball are sports that you can excel in, you know, and just like you said, with figure skating, it's the challenges of growing. Same thing probably with gymnastics is like, when you are growing, your center of gravity is always changing, just kind of coordination is difficult. And so there's those those challenges. And it's just, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It's just maybe by maybe the body that I was given can excel in in something else and hopefully still enjoy that something else. And so you found as you did shift to volleyball that you also loved that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was definitely um, being young and tall was a challenge for me, especially being in a sport like figure skating where there aren't as many other tall athletes. And so when I was uh, pursuing it competitively from like eight to 12 ish, I definitely struggled with loving my height. And so I think that's like a common thing that happens a lot when you are tall and young and a girl, especially. I think that a lot of the time you do struggle a little bit with having the confidence to wear your height and stand tall and, and really appreciate it. And then so, and so I think that although I think switching to volleyball not only kind of made me learn to like love that part of myself. And it's one of like, like I love being tall now. And I even I feel small actually out on the volleyball court. But <laughs> yeah, but like, I think that kind of development from learning to appreciate that part of myself, and also like learn how different body types are better suited to certain sports. I think that's like a really cool thing to acknowledge. And like, it was something that really helped me to to learn to like love my body and love like who I am was learning about how my body makes it makes me able to do the things that I am most passionate about and things that I love and, and like treating myself with care because of that. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate this conversation because it's, I think it's really interesting just the, the struggle, like, okay, so I'm reflecting on, on myself and I, I had the opposite issue, right? I wasn't even five feet in ninth grade. And I was so insecure about that because people thought I was 
younger and like treated me like I was younger and stuff. And so like that was hard. But I definitely think that society wise, I think I think it is harder on the tall girls growing up. And I'm not like, I can't really pinpoint why, because it's, it's, if there was a why it's a stupid reason, right? Like, (laughs) but it, you know, I can't, I'm not, I wasn't ever in your shoes to experience that. But I think if you could just kind of elaborate on some of the, the tactics or things you've learned to try and embrace your height throughout the years, like you're obviously in a really good place with that now, what were some other like things along your journey that helped you embrace the height that you were given? Yeah, I think that's, it's a really hard thing, I think, to kind of pinpoint and really acknowledge like when I started to really appreciate my height. And I think it started circumstantial. And I think that when I was playing volleyball, I loved being tall and I loved seeing the advantage that it could give me to touch higher or, or extend farther for a ball or something like that. And so I think when I was on the court, I loved my height. And then when it would be when I would go to class, then and all my classmates were shorter than me, then I maybe didn't love it as much in those scenarios. But I think that well, growing up, my mom would always tell me that she would love to be as tall as I was. So I'm actually taller than both my parents. So I'm like about six oh, wow. feet tall. And my mom, she's five six, even though she'd probably kill me for telling you that. <laughs> and my dad's like five nine, five ten. So I've been taller than them since I was about in ninth grade. And so they would always tell me that they would love to be as tall as I was. And when I was younger, I was like, there's no way you don't understand all of these kind of things about my pants are too short and like dealing with all these like little challenges that you don't even think about necessarily. But when I was surrounded by my teammates, I felt like I was in this kind of collective community where there were other people that were like me and had similar feelings about it. And, and then having teammates that were like, I don't know why you wouldn't love your height. Like I love my height. And so seeing them kind of like embrace it and really love it and own it. That was so awesome to me. I think really inspirational. And so surrounding my people, uh, surrounding myself with a community of people that were similar to me was really helpful in kind of me learning to love my height. And now here at Stanford, there's girls that are significantly taller than me, like six inches taller than me. And I'm one of the shorter people on the team, probably. So again, it's like a new kind of thing where I'm like, wow, I wish I was taller again. So (laughs) yeah, isn't that great? Mm -hmm. You know, right? I think, you know, just like your mom always saying she wishes she were taller. Like, I think part of this is to recognize that whole mindset of, oh, we always think the grass is greener on the other side, right? And, and that's not necessarily the case. So if that's not true, then then maybe what's true is the grass is greener where you water it. Meaning like, if this is the the body you were given, how can you love it, nourish it, respect it, like be proud of it and see where it can take you, right? And I think that putting that love and attention into yourself, just that alone is what actually gives you confidence in your body. And then yeah, I think part of the reason why we might feel insecure be about our body shape or size or about the way that we talk or the things that we think about or whatever is like if we feel like we're an outsider, if we feel like we're different. So finding your people, a community of like-minded or like-sized people can be helpful. And if if that's not in your immediate environment, your physical environment, even just knowing like people in the world that are like you do exist somewhere, you know? And so I think that's a huge part is surround, again, surrounding yourself with people who are going to help you in any aspect of your life, but definitely in your body image journey too. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was, it took me probably until getting to college to like really learn just about the impact of the people around me on my life and, and how influential they've been in shaping who I am and my thoughts about about myself in in every way. And I think that it just really emphasizes the importance of surrounding yourself with the best group of people that you can and and finding finding your people too. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hey fans, I hope you are enjoying this conversation, but an important part of it is a word from our awesome sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Inside Tracker. Thanks to Inside Tracker, I've been able to catch iron deficiency and anemia on two different occasions in the past few years. 
And with this, I was able to kickstart my recovery to better fueling and workouts without having to coordinate doctor's appointments or wait around for my lab results. With Inside Tracker, I'm able to get my blood drawn whenever I want to and see everything that I want to. Personally, I get the ultimate plan a couple times a year to check up on my blood biomarkers and nutritional status. And thanks to Inside Tracker, I'm able to implement the science based nutrition and lifestyle recommendations immediately after results come in with their user friendly online platform and personalized action plan. This is why I've been able to reverse iron deficiency so quickly because my health is in my own hands when I'm using Inside Tracker. Created by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometrics, Inside Tracker analyzes your blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data to identify where you're optimized and where you're not. You'll get a daily action plan with personalized guidance on the right exercise, nutrition, and supplementation for your body. And when you connect Inside Tracker with your Fitbit or Garmin, you'll also unlock real time recovery pro tips after you complete your workout. It's like having your own personal trainer and nutritionist in your pocket. For a limited time, you can get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store by heading to insidetracker.com forward slash rise up. There's a lot more that it can show you and that you can do with it besides just your iron. That's just my personal experiences. So again, head to insidetracker.com forward slash rise up. That's R I S E U P for 20% off. Back to the show. And, you know, speaking of body image, so, so we've talked about like your height and how you've learned to embrace and love that. Do you, in your experiences as a volleyball player, have there been any other body image challenges that you've experienced or you've watched and witnessed other teammates and friends experience just as a female athlete in, you know, high visibility sport or whether it be wearing, you know, the spandex shorts, this very notorious part of the uniform for volleyball players, like, What are some other body image challenges that you've seen or experienced? I think that there's definitely challenges associated with being a a female volleyball player, both on the indoor and the beach side. So growing up through club volleyball, typically you would play indoor volleyball during the fall, winter, spring seasons. And then in the summer, you'd go play on the beach. And when you play on the beach, you wear a bikini to play in. So obviously there's high visibility there and and definitely a lot of self-consciousness that comes from that and then even playing indoor the uniforms are fairly tight and you're wearing short spandex and so I think there is like a lot of self-awareness about how you maybe look in in your uniform whether it be indoor or on the beach and at least for me I've definitely had a lot of self-awareness over the years I would say more so as I got older, I think I started to become more aware of of how I looked. And I think a lot of it came with injury was when I struggled the most with my own body image because I wasn't able to be playing then and, and exercising that I would gain weight and I would feel self-conscious about that and, and maybe have a, a poor body image associated with that when I was coming back into my sport and starting to train again when I'm playing with girls that who haven't taken the last year off to recover it from an injury or something like that. And and so I think those were probably the most challenging parts of my athletic career with body image was dealing with kind of fluctuations in, in your physical appearance. When I went to college, I put on a lot of muscle mass and, and so kind of learning to accept that and really love the the I, I always like to say, like, love your strong. It's like, love what makes you strong. Love what makes you able to perform at your highest level. And for me, that was learning to, like, love my new, like, strong shoulders or, like, my, like, the muscle definition of my legs or, like, something like that that I didn't have in high school because of the more demanding training schedule that we had at, at Columbia and then even now coming here where we lift every single day. And so you definitely see your body change kind of throughout the season and throughout postseason and then change again when if you get injured or change again during the summer when you take time off. And and so I think just dealing with all of these constant changes throughout how you physically look throughout your career is what can sometimes cause a little bit of challenges with body image. Yeah, you just highlighted a lot of really good points. I was starting to write notes and stuff. So, I mean, I think that the concept of bodies changing being difficult, right? Like, I think we can all resonate with that. And like, here's the reality is is our bodies are 
always constantly changing. Like they were when we were kids too. Like we look different when we were 10 than we did when we were five, but it's like, we weren't aware of it at that age. Right. So I think there's the, the issue is that somewhere in our teenage years, or maybe like right around puberty is where I think there's this awareness of our body. And then, you know, we have a few years of maybe we're getting taller or like slowly gaining weight, but there's this, there's, there is for most of us, not everybody, but there is this point, whether it be puberty or the transition from high school to college, where there might be like this kind of more drastic change or like a much more noticeable. So now it's a, it's a noticeable change. And it's something that we're now aware of where when we were kids, like when we were 10, we just weren't really as aware yet, you know? Mm -hmm. But this transition from high school to college and the fact that now as a college athlete, it's like twofold. It's like one, you're getting older. And maybe like, I know when I was in college, I was not comfortable with the word woman. I was not comfortable with that word, but I'm going to say it now. Like you're, you're changing from a teenager to a woman, right? And there's like, there's body changes with that. There might be some fat storage. There might be some different shapes, some hips widening, some boobs or something like that. Right. And it's like, there's that to deal with. And then there's also as an athlete, like you train harder. Now you put on muscle. And here's the thing. Sometimes as a 14 year old, like you don't even have the capacity to build that muscle because your hormones aren't in the right place. And then suddenly when you're 20, like you do, and you train hard and it's a difficult transition, the body changing, the gaining weight, the muscles getting bigger, but it's like, you're changing into a female athlete. And so that your quote, your slogan, your mantra, like love your strong is because you're turning into a strong female athlete. It's this change, change isn't always bad, right? Like, I think that's why so many people struggle with it, but it's not bad. It's like, if you didn't change, then you'd still be playing at the high school level, you know, and then you wouldn't have found this athletic success that you did. So allowing your body to change and embracing the change is what enabled you to compete at your highest level. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that for me to come to kind of that realization and learn to appreciate that change a little bit more was really looking at other female athletes who were excelling and what did their bodies look like? I'm not looking at the Instagram models or the supermodels on the runways anymore. That's not where I want to be. I want to be performing on the court. And so what are other people that are performing on the court or on my team and, and seeing that they too are strong and they too have muscle mass and, and are, and go through these fluctuations in their body appearance and, and, and understanding that this is just a normal course of of being a human being even not even just an athlete just being a human in general and and I think that really helped me to to recognize that I perform best when I am not worried about how I'm physically looking but more concerned about how I'm feeling and how strong I feel and and how does my injury feel okay or like what how can I do to prevent this and and I think that kind of really allowed me to understand and learn to really love my body for what it is. Yeah. When you can really uh, appreciate all that your body is doing for you. And if you're feeling feeling happy mentally, being healthy physically, performing great athletically, then it's like, look at all the amazing things my body's doing for me. And then it's it's certainly a lot easier to appreciate, respect, and find confidence in your body. And, and if, look, I'm not to, I'm not here to say like, if, if you're not healthy physically, or if you're not performing great, that you should have poor body image. That's not what I'm saying at all. But the thing too, to fo- if like, if you are injured, like focus on healing that injury, don't focus on looking a certain way because you want to focus on actually feeling good. If you're not performing your best, that's okay. We all have our low moments. That's for sure. And just ask yourself, like, what, what do I need to do differently? Do I need to talk to coach? Do I need to feel better? Do I, you know, like, and focusing on that instead of body image, because I think when we get down into that trap of like blaming our body, so if we're like, oh, I'm not performing good and we're blaming our body for that, then we're focusing on the wrong thing. Now we're focusing on our body instead of our performance. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I think you brought up a really good point about about dealing with injury as well, because I think those were kind of my tougher moments with body image too, was when you don't have that kind of measure anymore of, well, my body's not performing because you're not 
actually physically participating in your sport. And so it becomes really easy to kind of fall into that trap of, oh, well, if I can't play, then maybe I want to look this certain way or like, and and so I think that is a really easy trap to fall into when you aren't able to participate in sport. And I think that's also like goes along with the transition out of sport. Once your once your athletic career is over is now finding, okay, well now my focus isn't on how do I make my body perform well on the court, but now it's more on how do I make myself feel good and how do, how do I kind of appreciate my body for maybe different reasons than I did before. Yes. This is really important. I'm glad you brought it up because it's, it's, like, again, it's a good tactic of thinking about like, what is your body doing for you? But if you're injured, we have to have like a different lens, like, right. So I think, I think really what it comes down to is that's a great tactic for improving your body image and confidence in yourself is thinking and appreciating all that your body does for you, but maybe it doesn't apply in every situation, right. During times of Mm -hmm. injury or something like that. So finding other things. I like how you said just how, like I, st- like, I like to use the word performance. How is my body performing? But I don't always mean athletically. Mm-hmm. So it could be, how is my mind performing? How am I performing uh, for me right now in, in work, in my job or for other or careers, for you school? How am I performing in my ability to show up as a family member, as a sister, as a daughter? You know, I think, I use the word performance, but I don't always mean athletically. And I think that's like when we think about during times of injury, what are other ways that we can lean into is how am I, it's really how am I showing up in my life? And yeah, how is my brain helping me? Maybe that's something I can be appreciative of where it used to be my my legs and how strong they were, but right now I'm focusing on the performance of my brain or maybe my heart or something like that, you know? So I think that's really important because- At the end of the day, too, there's a lot of overlap between our identity as an athlete and that giving us confidence and then that also giving us like body confidence, too. And I think that's maybe a great question to ask you is like, how do you separate body image from your identity, identity as an athlete or even just as a person? I think that as a a female athlete, especially our kind of relationship with body image often gets tied into our identity as a female athlete. And I do think a lot of that can kind of be caused by social media and the media in general. You would never see, I think, comments made about a a male athlete's body, but I think way too often do we see it about a female athlete's body, especially kind of when returning from a, a leave of absence for whatever reason it might be. And so I think because of that, it can often get tied in. For me, I try to separate the two. I think I try to separate the two just by not worrying about... Sorry, this is like a tough question. Um, It's a really hard question. (laughs) (laughs) I think I really try to separate the two by trying not to focus too much on micromanaging my body. I think that when I start to micromanage exactly what I'm eating and exactly how often I'm working out, that's when my body image might start to suffer. And and so I think that for some people that works great by tracking everything. But I know for myself from previous experience that when I do track everything down to the nine, then that's when I start to kind of develop almost an obsessive mindset with it. And that's when it becomes tied into my identity. And and that's when kind of like athlete and body image gets really wishy-washy for me. Whereas like, if I'm able just to be mentally present when I'm per, like on the court or in the weight room or in meetings for volleyball or anything like that, and, and not have thoughts about oh, when am I going to eat the, my next meal or what exactly I'm going to put into it or when am I going to go work out because I just had like a huge dinner and dessert last night or something like that. That's like when I think that I am able to separate the two and and really try to focus on that. Yeah, no, that was a hard question. Sorry about that. (laughs) (laughs) But it's important. I think I'm going to share this with you and my listeners too. I've definitely shared it with many of my clients. It's a little bit morbid, but bear with me. 
I think I had this huge aha moment in separating like body image and my body just from my identity when I, I don't know, I was listening to this podcast one day and I can't even recite what it is because I forget, but I had this huge aha moment when it was talking about death and just the concept of like, when you die, your body is still here and yet you're gone. Mm-hmm. And guess what? Everybody is incredibly sad that you're gone. Nobody cares that your body is still here. Like, and I had this huge aha moment that it was like, oh my God, I am not my body, you know, because yeah. like when I die, my body's here, but I'm gone. And that was this weird click for me of like, I am not my body. And therefore I can separate who I am and my identity from what my physical body is or what that looks like. So a little morbid, but maybe eye-opening for some people if you allow yourself to think about it. And it's weird too, because in some ways it like, it disconnects you, which I think can be helpful, especially if you're really struggling with body image. Sometimes it's helpful to know like, I am not my body and, and separate your identity. At the same time, when we're talking about like embracing and loving your body, like you were earlier, like with your height and stuff, like you do want to feel connected to your body as well, because it's the only body we're given in the life that we have. And so there's a balance, right? Of knowing I am not my body and yet I can embrace and love this body that I was given. And I think you can lean into each concept like whenever you need it. I think you mentioned earlier as we were talking, like in some moments, like maybe you're loving your body and then in different moments, different environments, not so much, right? So you can lean into one during a certain time and another during another. Yeah. I really like that. I think that's a, like an awesome way to think about it and kind of having that interesting dichotomy between the two of like completely dissociating from your body being tied into your identity, but also learning to appreciate it for what it, what it's able to do. I think that's really cool and uh, an awesome way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now you also brought up Emily, like that micromanaging your body, maybe your nutrition, like that definitely makes things actually worse. And it's so crazy because so it's like people's instinct is if, if, oh, if I don't like my body, maybe I need to micromanage it. And it like, it literally, for most people doesn't at all. Like it makes it worse. And so it's a really interesting concept that like as a dietitian over here, like people are always asking me about body image. And sometimes I'm even like, why are these two things even related? You know, mm-hmm. like there's almost like, hey, like what you eat, I'm not saying there's no correlation to your body at all, your shape or size, but like, it's not this direct correlation. And I think that's the problem is when people start to micromanage their their nutrition, it's because they're thinking there's this direct correlation to nutrition will change or affect or dictate how I look. And it is not that direct of a correlation, which then you're micromanaging, you're obsessing, you're then not seeing air quote results that you think you should, you get actually worse body image, worse confidence because of it. And now you're just stressed the heck out on top of that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had, I definitely had, I have experienced some of those feelings before where when you do really try to micromanage, it's, it's so hard to make that a sustainable practice too. And so sure, you might think that it's a, okay for like a couple of weeks and you're like, oh, this isn't too bad. But sustaining that long term is just not possible for me, at least. And, and so I kind of learned to recognize that as okay, well, maybe instead of focusing on exactly what is going into all my food and exactly the number of minutes that I'm exercise, let's I should focus more on how how am I feeling in this moment and kind of like, listening to my body and listening to maybe what am I craving, it's okay for me to go have a, a sweeter dessert if, if that's really what I feel like I'm craving or and how what types of foods make me feel good when I'm playing what types of foods make me feel good when I'm doing homework or studying or and and how does exercise kind of tie into all of this and and I think kind of taking more of that approach of just listening to my body and what I need and listening to like my internal signals as to as to indicate my nutrition and my exercise, that was a lot more sustainable for me than trying to micromanage everything and, and kind of eliminated that feeling of, of stress and maybe overwhelm the uh, uh, feelings of over, of being overwhelmed that kind of came with micromanaging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so it sounds like you're very, at this point in time, you know, maybe had some 
uh, as we all do at some point, like where, how do we learn lessons? Probably because we, uh, we struggled at some point you learned. So how, how would you kind of describe your current, I don't want to say like nutrition habits, but just like things you focus on to fuel your body. Well, it sounds like you do, like if you're craving something, you listen to that, but you're also in tune with like, what makes me feel good on the court. Do you have any like just general tips maybe for other college volleyball players of lessons you've learned along the way of how to fuel and nourish your body and still give it what it likes or things that you just know work, work for you. Mm -hmm. I think for me, having a balance is really important. I have, I love like all carbs. Like it's kind of like my kryptonite. Like I just love like pastas, breads and all that stuff. And so I think restricting that from my diet is just not I'm not going to be happy if I were to do that. And and so I think making sure that I have a balance at each of my meals with foods and making foods that I'm going to enjoy at the end of the day, like finding new recipes to make and, and trying different types of food. And, and I also have like a huge sweet tooth. So I think finding like snacks that work really well for me or like, I love chocolate. So like maybe after dinner, I'll have a little bit of chocolate with the coffee or something like that. And and so I think like my biggest tip is just to don't focus on restricting things from your diet, but rather figuring out ways that you can include them and and maintain a healthy, maintain a healthy diet that makes you feel good, both mentally and physically. Right. And I think that's huge is that nourishing yourself is a physical and a mental thing. So you want to, it's not just what, what foods, well, it is what foods do I like to nourish me mentally? And then what foods make my body feel good. And it's, if we're focusing only on one of those aspects, that's where, you know, things might go astray, right? Like I love ice cream, but if I ate ice cream for every meal, I wouldn't feel good physically. But as long as I don't restrict it and I allow ice cream in my diet, then I'm also like, I'm feeling good physically. And also I'm happy mentally because I'm not restricting. And so I love your advice to other, other college athletes regarding finding that balance, not restricting and focusing on how your body feels is really great. So, well, Emily, this has been an awesome conversation and we're coming up on time. I know you got to get going because you've got a game tonight to get to. So you got to get your mind right and start focusing. So to wrap up this podcast, I like to ask every guest the same questions, just four in a row. So the first one, Emily, if there's one food you could eat every single day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would that be? That's a really good question. Um, I'm going to go with chocolate. Perfect. It's a great answer. How about what is your favorite sport to participate in? Mine has to be volleyball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're doing so much of it right now. It's got to be. How about as a spectator? Is it still volleyball or is there a different sport that you love being a fan and somebody on the sidelines of? I really love basketball and tennis. I kind of grew up, my family, we love watching basketball and tennis games. So kind of whenever we'd get the chance to go to one of those games, whenever they came to Toronto, we would always make an effort to do so. So I'd say I love still watching both those sports. That's awesome. Great. And then last question, Emily, if there's another female athlete out there that you want to give a shout out to for being a role model and inspiration for any reason, whether she's somebody well known or in your personal life, who would that be and why? I think that there are so many female athletes that I could think of that are just amazing. Serena Williams is amazing. She's just such a great role model for I think all women out there and and just really she's such a strong female mentor to really look up to that I think she's someone that I would love to be able to have a conversation with one day and and just learn so much from her and I also think that Victoria Garrick is she played volleyball at USC and she's done some really amazing podcasts and and YouTube videos talking about body image that have definitely helped me along the way so she's definitely a role model that I look up to and another volleyball player as well mm -hmm. so Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing those. And thank you yourself, Emily, for being a role model to other female athletes yourself. I really enjoyed this conversation and good luck tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I love chatting with you. Fans, thank you so, so much for listening. But before you go, I don't want you to miss out on things that I know you need. First, if you need help overcoming nutrition concerns, perhaps something we talked about in this episode, look no further. You have your female athlete specialist in sports dietetics right here. 
So head to my website, www.riseupnutritionrun.com and book a free call with me to learn more about how I may be able to help you. My flagship program, the Female Athlete System of Transformation, aka the Fast Track, helps female athletes overcome disordered eating and perform at their highest level. The life-changing transformations that we help clients with don't just happen by listening to podcasts. It happens by taking action with people who are guiding you to your goals, aka me. So call me, head to the website, www.risefnutritionrun.com and book it in. Take action, overcome your nutrition struggles as fast as possible. I am here to help. Second, don't forget about our amazing sponsors, Inside Tracker, insidetracker.com forward slash rise up for 20% off. Also, we are supported by Orgain. If you are an athlete in need of a quick fueling option with clean, good ingredients, look no further than Orgain. I absolutely love their ready to drink whey based shakes for post workout on the go. As a listener of this podcast, enjoy 30% off your first order with the code RISEUP30. All caps, RISEUP30. Last, if you are a dietitian, coach, or health professional needing a platform to manage your business, coordinate with your clients, invoice, communicate, and more, look no further than practice better. Get a 14-day free trial and 20% off your first four months by clicking the link in the show notes and using the code RISEUP20. I've been using practice better for four years now to manage my business, and I promise it's the best way to manage your practice. Look, lady, since you are doing all of those things for you, my last request, if you're willing, is to do something for me. Please head over to our ratings and reviews, leave a five-star rating, leave a positive review if you like this podcast, and please tell a friend about this amazing podcast or an episode that you think they need so that you and others around you can be fierce, fit, and fueled. Until next time, fuel fiercely. Fuel fiercely.